Thank you to all the supporters of HMS Unicorn who made this online talk possible. If you would like to support the work of HMS Unicorn, then please head to www.hmsunicorn.org.uk and donate. The History of Chatham Dockyard Guest Speaker Philip McDougall Founded in 1570, Chatham Dockyard quickly became one of the most important naval yards for the repair and building of warships, maintaining a preeminent position for the next 400 years. Located on the River Medway, the yard was responsible for the construction of over 500 warships, including HMS Unicorn. Author Philip McDougall discusses the history of Chatham Dockyard and its place within the overall historical context of naval dockyards and naval construction. Um, right, the title of my talk is um, The Rise and Fall of an Industrial Military Complex, um, and it, it's sort of loosely based on, on one of the books I've written about Chatham Dockyard, but I've also written considerably about the, the Medway Town, so um, there's just one of the other books there that um, I've written. Um, I always date the foundation of Chatham Dockyard to the year 1568, so we're, we're in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I here. And I do that based on the, the grounds that in 1568, that was the year in which um, a flag, the flag of St George, was built for the dockyard and would have been raised over the area of Chatham that had become uh, an area for the repair and building of ships. Now, before that, the River Medway was very much, um, was still very much a centre for the uh, naval warships because um, during earlier years, the, the Navy had actually brought most many of its ships into the Medway uh, where they were, they were moored. But at that time, there was no official dockyard. So what tended to happen was that if they wanted to clean the hulls, as you can see in the first picture there, uh, they would bring it onto the, the banks, the soft banks, the soft mud banks of the Medway. The, sh the ship would be heaved over and um, the tar would be burnt off and the hull generally cleaned. And then on the next high tide, the ship would be raised off the shore and turned round so that the other side could undergo the same same process. Once you've got dry docks, you can start doing that inside a dry dock. But Chatham at that time, uh, even when it was becoming uh, a naval dockyard, didn't actually have dry docks until a few years later. And, and the other picture you've got there is uh, Matthew Baker, a senior or a leading shipwright of the period, uh, designing one of, the, uh, one of the warships for Queen Elizabeth's Navy. Chatham Dockyard wasn't the first of the naval dockyards to be built in the south. Um, the first was actually Portsmouth during the reign of Henry VII, and then during the reign of Henry VIII, other dockyards were established at Woolwich and Deptford. And why Woolwich and Deptford? Because being much closer to London, it was easier for the king to get out to see his ships and to bring um, dignitaries that he wanted to impress. So in, in that sense, Chatham was effectively the fourth of the uh, English Navy Dockyards. An important year in the history of Chatham Dockyard, uh, by which time it had been considerably enlarged and had uh, two dry docks and two building slips and actually moved into a, a much, had actually moved by that time onto its present site um, because the earlier dockyard was uh, further towards the town of Chatham and immediately below the parish church. But telling you that probably doesn't mean much unless you know Chatham in particular. But anyway, an important year for Chatham was 1667. And that was the, uh, the year of the Dutch raid. Um, important in the sense that it nearly got destroyed. The Dutch, um, having decided that one way to uh, get their revenge on the English Navy was to sail up the Medway and with an attempt to destroy the dockyard. It was, it was one of England's, in, one of the English Navy's most embarrassing defeats because in fact, the, the Dutch did get into the Medway. They destroyed the dockyard at Sheerness, which was at that time being built. So Sheerness, we can count as possibly the fifth naval dockyard. Um, 
And at that time it was being built um, and it had limited defences. So the Dutch were able to destroy that. Over the next two or three days, and they were very fortunate because the Medway isn't the easiest of rivers to navigate in a sailing ship, but the winds worked very much in their favour, for which they were thankful, for which they uh, thanked God for that. And eventually it arrived at just out, just beyond Upna. And Upna was really the major fortification defending the naval dockyard at Chatham at that time. And as you can see, it's uh, an Elizabethan fortification and was heavily armed with cannon. And it was that, that that really prevented the Dutch getting a little bit further upriver because whilst Upna now lies opposite the dockyard at Chatham, it, um, it was uh, at that time, the Chatham Dockyard was slightly smaller and hadn't extended that far. So by not getting beyond Upner Castle, they weren't able to uh, get any further uh, for the point of view of uh, destroying the dockyard at Chatham. Uh, given a few more days, they might have done, but they were also concerned they might be bottled up into the River Medway with the result that uh, they'd uh, be trapped by an English fleet preventing them getting out and, and thus they'd have to surrender. So... Um, the image on the, on the other side, um, the upper image, is of a ship that was discovered in the 1870s. It was at that time that Chatham was undergoing a massive extension. And during the extension, during the time of digging the extension, they discovered that uh, they discovered a timber ship. It now lies under one of the uh, basins, one of the large basins at Chatham Dockyard, and it is presumably still there. Um, but it's reckoned to have been one of the ships, one of the old hulks that had been brought into the Medway to defend, help defend the Medway against the Dutch attack. Because as the defence is not only included up in the castle, but it included a very heavy chain that ran across the river, although the Dutch soon got over that. But a number of other ships had been, uh, had been so positioned to help defend against the Dutch attack. But uh, the Dutch uh, burnt a number of these ships and um, unmoored them. So the ship, in fact, this one, what had happened was that it, um, it, it on fire, it had actually um, drifted into what's known as St Mary's Channel, and it was there that it sunk. And St Mary's and St Mary's Channel uh, actually was the site of three large basins. So the the water of St Mary's Channel was converted into these heavy basins, and that's when they discovered this particular ship. In modern day times, of course, this would in more present in present day times, of course, this would be considered a, a massive and important find. And it's likely that the ship itself could be the St. Matthias, which was previously, I think, um, a Dutch ship, a Dutch warship that had been captured by the British, uh, by the English, sorry, during the earlier part of the uh, wars against the, the Dutch. And here we actually see a photo of that uh, that particular ship. Um, it's, um, it, it's, as I say, now somewhere under one of the basins, whether it's been completely destroyed, I don't know. But all they did was um, take some drawings of it and uh, photographed the, uh, the remains that they, they uncovered. Um, moving forward to the dockyard at the beginning of the 18th century, we're, we're actually now talking about the dockyard which during the 18th century was effectively a dockyard that um, specialised in the construction of warships, but also the repair of warships. And I'll come back to that in a moment as to why that should be. But having skipped most of the, having skipped most of the 17th century, I should point out that during the 1600s, when the Dutch uh, were attacking or attempted to attack the yard at Chatham. Chatham at that time was the most important of the English naval dockyards. Normally one refers to Portsmouth as being the most important and certainly that, that was the case for much of the time, but during the 17th century and at the end of the 16th century, when it was um, first established by Queen Elizabeth, Chatham dockyard had overtaken all of the other dockyards in size so that it was the most important of all of the dockyards. And the reason for that, quite simply, 
was that um, the enemy at that time during the 17th century was the, was the Dutch and any naval battles being fought were likely to be fought either in the North Sea or, or the um, English Channel on uh, the that portion of the English Channel which lies closest to the Thames and Medway and for that reason ships receiving uh, damage during actions fought at sea or for the quick um, the quick assembly of ships to take on the Dutch would have to be based either around Goodwin Sands or the Thames Estuary and the Thames Estuary, the moorings there for warships was the Nore, which lies just off Sheerness and the Isle of Grain. But the Medway itself, um, the, the, the naval dockyard of Chatham lies with, um, up the river Medway. And therefore it lies much closer to that, that particular vicinity. Um, it was only when the, major, the country's major enemy became the French uh, that it became necessary to establish a further dockyard at Plymouth, Plymouth Devonport, and considerably increase the size of Portsmouth because when the fort wars were being fought against the French, then the scenes of battle were going to be out in the Channel and the Atlantic and off the uh, coasts of France and into the Mediterranean. So you needed a dockyard that was differently positioned. But at that time also, Chatham was a difficult dockyard to reach. There were, it's about 10 or 11 miles upriver. There are numerous twists and turns in the Medway. And as well as that, to get to Chatham, you have to navigate the Thames itself. And sometimes it might take as long as six weeks to get a ship, a, a large warship from the mouth of the Medway to Chatham because you were reliant upon the right, the correct winds. And if you didn't have the correct winds, you would have to uh, stay in position for a considerable amount of time until the winds veered round in the direction you needed. That's why in referring to the Dutch a little bit earlier on, I was saying that they were very fortunate about the winds because not only were they able to get up the river within three or four days, but they were able to get back down um, Get, they were able to get down the Medway uh, very quickly because they feared uh, the position that an English fleet was about to bottle them in. That, in fact, wasn't true. And they would actually have had no trouble in uh, probably fending off the gunfire from up the castle and getting close to the dockyard for its destruction. But they were not aware of where the English fleet was at that time. But it was actually nowhere near uh, the Thames. So they would not have been bottled up. Um, so. One of the problems that Chatham faced and why it was eventually to be overtaken in a big way by both Plymouth and Portsmouth was the difficulty of navigating the Medway. Uh, think about it. If you've got a, a warship and it takes six weeks to get to Chatham Dockyard from the mouth of the Medway and then maybe three or four weeks to get back out of the Medway, you've lost during a wartime period a, a major warship for 10 weeks in just trying to get into the dockyard. Nevertheless, the amount of work that had to be carried out on it. So that's why Chatham became involved in building ships and in heavy repair work. So that if it took six weeks to get a ship into the dockyard, it didn't matter because heavy repair work could mean that the ship was there for another six, seven, eight months under repair or even longer. So uh, the facilities at Chatham were very much geared to heavy repair, heavy repair work and the building of ships. So what you're looking at is a map of the dockyard at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, but additionally, it's showing the defences. So if you look at it, you'll see that along the front of the dockyard that faces onto the River Medway, you've got a, a couple of shaded um, inlets. Uh, and they're actually building slips. Then you've got beyond that, you um, in the middle, you have another four um, inlets of water, really. And they're the dry docks. And what would happen is that at high tide, a ship would be brought into a dry dock. The dry dock would then be sealed by a gate. And the water would then flow out at low tide as the, as the tide receded. Uh, in other words, they were gravity drained. It wasn't until the, uh, the 19th century that steam pumps were introduced 
uh, steam pumps were introduced slightly earlier at Portsmouth, but at Chatham, you didn't get steam pumps until about the 1820s, which meant that uh, one disadvantage was that uh, if you were relying on gravity drainage, um, the docks themselves were fairly shallow. So um, at one time, you couldn't get the very biggest of ships into Chatham because their, their draft was too uh, the, the draft was too great. Um, so once the water had drained out of the dry dock, what would then happen is that the well the ship would have to have been shored up first, and then once the uh, uh, the water was drained out, you then had access to the hull. So you were no longer relying upon uh, drawing up a ship onto a sandy or a muddy or a muddy bank, in which uh, you put heaved her over in order to um, clean clean the hull and obviously at that time any other repair work would be carried out as well as that Chatham possessed everything that was needed to repair and construct ships in in the sense that these were manufactured in the dry in in the dockyard with the exception of ordnance guns were manufactured elsewhere and then were brought to uh, an ordnance wharf that lay on the as far as looking at this map on the the right hand side of the dockyard and that site of the ordnance wharf was actually the previous site of the tudor yard so what had happened is that during the 17th century a massive new dockyard was built and this lay uh, further up river from the original tudor yard and as i said the tudor yard was the ordnance wharf and if you go to Chatham today, there are still some buildings which, uh, um, which are part of that old Ordnance Wharf. So what you're looking at here, and if I move from the left hand side to the right hand side, the two squares that are slightly shaded in, they are mast ponds. Then moving across, you would have had timber stores and various store buildings. And moving right over to the extreme right hand side of the um, the dockyard as you're looking at on this map are those very long buildings that's the ropery in the middle of the yard at the back are the um is the accommodation for officers and um, you've got a series of officers houses the more important the officer the slightly larger his house so that the shipwright the master shipwright and the master attendant the most important or among the most important officers of the yard, had houses at the center of this block, and those houses were larger than the more uh, inferior officers that had the slightly smaller houses uh, on either side of that block. But the largest house of all was the house of the resident commissioner. And he was the person that had not really overall responsibility for the yard because his position was slightly peculiar. He, he wasn't really a manager, but he received all of the communication from the Navy board, the, the body that was responsible for the naval dockyards, and he disseminated this information to um, the other officers and would report back to the Navy board if he wasn't happy with what was happening. But it was the master shipwright and the master attendant that were the most senior officers. The master shipwright was the officer responsible for all of the work on dry land, in other words, the dockyard itself. And the master attendant was responsible for all ships held in the River Medway. And the River Medway was a major naval anchorage and large numbers of naval warships would be found to be there during peacetime. Uh, if you think in terms of a modern navy, ships were often at sea, peace and war, but during the 18th century and earlier, and up until the mid-19th century, there was really no standing navy. Ships only went to sea, normally went to sea, when there was a war on. A, a few ships would be at sea, guard ships and so on. So you, during a peacetime period, the Medway would have literally, would have somewhere in the region of 30 or 40 ships moored in the river. They were the responsibility of the dockyard, but uh, the master attendant saw that they were maintained while in the river and on board each ship would be a, a small number of individuals who would maintain those ships regularly, um, would be checking out those ships. But if, if something, if a major problem occurred on a ship while moored in the Medway, there was a, a group of shipwrights who went from one ship to another and they were under the control of the master attendant. But when a ship was brought into the dockyard itself, it became the responsibility of the master shipwright. And so a ship in dry dock 
is the responsibility of the master shipwright and ships under construction were the responsibility of the master shipwright. Um, now, as I said, that uh, Chatham Dockyard was responsible for, build, for constructing much of, most of the items needed by a ship. So it had smitheries that um, manufactured the ironwork, such as anchors, primarily anchor work during the uh, 18th century. Uh, the ropery, which uh, supplied all of the uh, cables and ropes needed by a ship. It had a sail loft where sails were cut and shaped. It had a flag. It had a, a colour loft where flags were sewn and manufactured and the mast ponds that I mentioned, buildings around the mast pond were, uh, the workers there were responsible for manufacturing masts. So there's very little that the dockyard itself didn't do. Um, you'll see a reference to Brompton in this map. That's where a lot of the dockyard workers lived in that uh, township that was laid just by the dockyard. And around the dockyard itself were, uh, during the 18th century, a considerable number of defences were built. Uh, this is a, a bird's eye view, so to speak. It's actually a, an 18th century painting, but, um, uh, and uh, nobody you know, didn't have the ability to, to do this at the time. But what you're seeing there in the centre, of the very centre of the picture, uh, and moving towards the left, are the mast ponds and the mast houses. Uh, you can see some ships under construction there, and one ship, the nearest, is a ship in on a building slip that's close to being launched. Uh, I've listed there all of the other dockyards that were uh, that were that contributed to the English, but later obviously the British Navy. So, um, and they're rough. They are in order of that they were established. So you've got Portsmouth, Henry VII, the reign of Henry VII, Woolwich and Deptford, reign of Henry VIII, Chatham, Elizabeth, Sheerness, um, J, well, 1660s, so uh, Charles II, uh, Plymouth, William III, Pembroke during the Napoleonic Wars, and Rosyth just prior to the, uh, well, it actually came into operation in 1916, but it was under construction uh, just prior to the First World War. Um, an important aspect of the yard, of course, was the, uh, the building of ships. And here we see the launching of a major warship. And you'll notice that uh, she's actually undercover. The 18th century, all ships, during the 18th century, all ships were built in the open, either on a building slip or a dry dock. But from the 1820s onwards, Chatham gradually gained uh, a, a number of covered slipways. And the reason for building these slipways was that uh, whenever a ship was about to be launched, uh, sorry, when a ship was completed, it had to uh, remain, uh, it had to season in frame. In other words, for six months, it, after it was completed and ready for launching, it wouldn't actually be launched for six months to allow it to, uh, for the timbers to season in frame. And to prevent uh, early rotting of these timbers, through uh, rain and weather. Um, it was normal to cover over a ship to give it some protection. Well, that was quite time consuming. And if you actually built a covered slip, it saved the work of having to cover over a ship all of the time. Now you might think, foolishly of course, that uh, these, uh, these were built to protect the workers so that they could uh, carry on working during any time um irrespective of the weather but that was not the case these these huge coverings were there to protect the ships not the workforce and what we've got here therefore is a ship that um is it's it's actually in the process of being launched it's sliding down the ways into the river medway and it will uh, it will continue going out into the medway um, but to stop it hitting the, the shore on the other side, there are various chains that will bring it to a, a standstill. Um, here we've got, uh, obviously the most important timber required for shipbuilding was oak. Uh, the, the oak there that's on a, on a wagon, that you can see how oak was brought into the yard. Um, oak would be uh, brought in from various forests and woodlands, it, mostly in the south, because it was considered that Sussex and Kent oak uh, 
was the best. And often the Navy Board would stipulate when it was ordering oak that it actually had to come from the home counties. Uh, the reason is that the, the weather was ideal growing weather for oak that was required for shipbuilding. The reason I've entitled that chips is that uh, if you worked in a naval dockyard and you worked with the timbers uh, during the 18th and early 19th century, you had one little additional perk that was you could carry out of the yard chips. Now, chips does not mean in this case French fries. It means that um, they were small pieces of timber that were no longer of use in shipbuilding so that you had to walk out of the gate it couldn't be any longer than uh, three feet in length. I think it was three feet in length. It had to be carried out over the shoulder. Unfortunately, some naval dockyard workers had the habit of uh, disappearing during the, uh, the morning or afternoon because you could take these timbers out at lunchtime and in the evening. So they might disappear sometime during the morning and sometime during the afternoon and find a nice uh, nine foot piece of timber and cut it into three foot lengths and uh, therefore take it out of the yard. Um, that was one of the things that, um, well, it was one of the frauds or scams that uh, the Navy Board tried to cut down on. Um, a ship such as the one that you can see, um, uh, I think it's probably a third rate, but a ship of about 74 guns would require in total, 25 miles of rope or more. And these ropes and cables had to re be renewed on a fairly regular basis, every three years possibly. Um, and it was the naval dockyards that manufactured all of the ropes and cables needed by, uh, by warships under construction or repair in these naval dockyards, as well as ships that were being built in the merchant yards, because merchant yards might build the hull, but they then had to bring it to a naval dockyard for completion. So the rope for all of these ships had to be manufactured in the naval dockyards. And um, the reason these buildings were so long is that to manufacture that rope, the buildings themselves had to be as long as the longest piece of rope required on a warship. What we see here on the right hand side is the um, ropery at Chatham. The bike, the, the bike there is an essential requisite because uh, the quickest, the easiest and quickest way to get from one end of the building to the other is actually to cycle along the length of the building. So that's why that cycles there. Uh, obviously, that wouldn't have been available in the 18th century. Um, and the lowest floor of the ropery was for the manufacture of the heaviest cables, those required for heaving up and down the anchors. But you also had uh, ropes that were required for the masts, the masts, the rigging, standing rigging, um, ropes for buckets, ropes for hammocks. All of this was produced in the, in the naval roperies. Chatham had a naval ropery, as did Portsmouth, Woolwich and Devonport. The, the ropery at Portsmouth ceased to function in the um, 19th century because uh, there, was, there was not so much rope being required in steam ships. But the ropery at Chatham continued to manufacture rope for the Navy. Well, it still does in a way uh, because HMS Victory in Portsmouth Dockyard still requires rope, which is manufactured at the dockyard at Chatham, but Chatham Dockyard was actually closed in 1981. What we're talking about is um, it's now a historic site and therefore a private company undertakes the rope making there, um, but it allows visitors to see how rope was traditionally made during the 18th century and earlier. And they have actually got some of the earliest machinery there for people to see. Um, all right, a couple more views of the uh, rope. And the machine on the right hand side is actually testing chain cable, but a machine like this used to exist in the dockyard. And in order to test the strength of rope to make sure that uh, it was up to the quality that was required on a ship, what would happen is that the rope would be um, attached to the machine and the machine would continue to, to pull and pull and pull on the rope, measuring the strength of the rope until it actually snapped. Um, if it snapped well above 
the strength that it should have, that was fine. But if it snapped prior to getting to that strength, then obviously the whole batch of rope had to be destroyed or, or used in for something else. So that was the way they tested the rope before it was taken to a warship. Um, this is the smithery, and I will actually come back to the smithery later because it, it's got an important connection with the unicorn. But uh, the smithery was uh, where all ironwork for ships was constructed at Chatham, including the anchors, which uh, the largest anchor was measured as uh, 20 hundredweight. And why I've headed this strong beer is that the smiths themselves were working in extremely hot conditions and in fact during the summer months they couldn't manufacture the largest anchors because it was simply too hot so in order to ensure that their thirst was quenched they were allowed each day eight pints of strong beer and even with those eight pints of strong beer they still man um, they still managed to uh, complete their work um, and you've got there a view of um, hms victory just to show the positioning of the um, the largest of the anchors, uh, the anchor that was rarely used because it was only really used in an emergency if a ship was approaching a rocky shore or a, a dangerous area of water, that anchor, the, the largest anchor would then, then be dropped. Um, usually smaller anchors were used for mooring a ship and also for um, moving a ship around. Um, low pay. This is the entrance to uh, Chatham Dockyard, uh, the main entrance. Uh, there are other entrances constructed later, but this was the entrance that existed during the time that Unicorn was under construction. Um, low pay because during the 18th century, between 1660 and roughly 1770, the uh, dockyard workers at, uh, in any of the dockyards did not receive a pay rise. Um, so in 1660, shipwrights were being paid at the rate of two and a penny a day, and at, by 1770, they were still being paid at the rate of two and a penny a day. Uh, the concept of inflation wasn't realised, um, but it did lead to a number of strikes, and eventually they introduced a new system of working, uh, peace rates, a task called task work, and what would happen is that the gang of shipwrights would be paid uh, once they completed a specific amount of work, that would be recorded. They were paid every three months. Um, and, and so they, they would, um, yeah. So basically they, they were paid eventually on task rate, task work, but the Navy Board wasn't too happy about that because it did mean that uh, work was sometimes rushed and the quality of workmanship wasn't as good. But on the other hand, uh, on the day pay, um, the naval dockyard works had no incentives, so they tended to work quite slowly. Um, so it was, it was finding a happy medium that they continued to work in the naval dockyards on low pay, especially when compared with the merchant yards where they might receive a much higher reward, was that it was a job for life. Once you were employed in a naval dockyard, you, uh, you were employed for the rest of your life, and you even got a pension. They, they introduced pensions during the, um, about 1775. Uh, this was the most unusual, um, but uh, pensions were issued. They had um, a medical service so that uh, they had access to a doctor. So for injuries in work um, or illnesses, they could actually go to a, a, a physician within the, the naval dockyard. Um, other workers who weren't employed in the naval dockyards rarely had such a, such a right. Um, so, and the important thing was that if you worked in a merchant yard, you constructed a ship, you, once the ship was launched, you might not have a job. If that happened in a, in a naval dockyard, you were still retained. And the reasoning for that was that uh, in wartime, naval dockyards needed to do huge amounts of work. During peacetime, they weren't doing a great deal of work, but supposing there was a sudden outbreak of war, they didn't want to spend three or four months trying to recruit labor, they kept it there. So they might only be employed on the minimum wage of two and a penny a day, but come a wartime period, you would then be offered overtime, but uh, you wouldn't get overtime during peacetime years. Um, right. Chatham played an important role in the construction of iron shipbuilding, and I'll come to its most important role in a moment, but I want to concentrate for a moment on HMS Unicorn, 
which, as you know, was constructed at Chatham Dockyard, and it was launched on the 30th of March, 1824. Now, large ships got huge amounts of publicity when they were launched, but the publicity for Unicorn, because she was a frigate launched during a peacetime period in which the Navy was undergoing, uh, was trying to cut back, or the Navy Board and the Admiralty were cutting back on financial expenditure as much as possible. Not a great deal was made of the Unicorn launch. Um, I mean, this is a typical example. This comes from a newspaper called the Public Ledger Daily Advertiser. So it's a national newspaper. And um, on the 8th of April, 1824, it's simply reported and other, apart from local newspapers, uh, national newspapers didn't give it a great deal of coverage. So you've got simply this statement, quote from the newspaper, the unicorn of 40 guns was launched from Chatham Dockyard, the 30th out. She is ordered to be docked, to be coppered and put in a state of ordinary. What that means is that uh, she's launched from a slipway, a building slip. She is then taken into a dry dock where further work will be carried out on her, including the coppering of her hull. Uh, her coverings, she's already got those coverings on because she's now going to be taken into the medway for more to be moored. If it had been a wartime period, she would have um, been given masts, sails, rigging, everything else would have been added. But it's not a wartime period, so she's not needed for sea. So if she is simply going to be coppered in a dry dock, and then she will be taken into the ordinary. The ordinary refers to the River Medway, where moorings had been established um, since the, the reign of Queen Elizabeth, had been established for various warships, and her moorings will be one that is suited to a frigate. Some moorings were much deeper because um, they were the, um, the first rate ships that required a, a greater draft. So once she's launched, she's taken round to one of the dry docks, she enters a dry dock and uh, coppered and then taken out and she will remain in the moorings where she will become the responsibility of the master attendant. But there are some notable features about the unicorn, um, the fact that she's got a round stern and uh, there's, uh, um, so what I've got here is a quote on the 2nd of March 1824 in which the unicorn is listed as one of the ships that has actually been uh, with a round stern has either been um, constructed at Chatham or converted to a round stern. Um, agreeable to your letter of the 22nd, I send you on the other side here of a list of the ships of the line and frigates which have been built or repaired with circular sterns at this yard and also those in hand building repairing with such sterns. Obviously the unicorn at that, start, at that time was technically one of those building repairing but she was actually on the eve of her launch and something else uh, that comes out from these documents is the, the the strong possibility that some of her timbers came from Stratfield Say estate which the, the Duke of Wellington's estate the Duke of Wellington has in the Battle of Waterloo of course um, you can't be exactly certain here, but um, there is a clear statement that a large amount of timber had come from Stratfield Say. It wasn't considered to the best timber, but it was suitable for shipbuilding. And at the time it arrived, work was underway on the Unicorn. So it's likely that some of her timbers actually came from Stratfield Say. Um, the, um, the, the circular or round stern, the advantage of this was discussed in 1819. So this again is a document uh, that uh, was sent to the Navy board. Well, it's, it's probably under the influence of Seppings, but referring to the round stern, some of observations were made with regard to the angles which may be formed in pointing the guns in the after parts in both ships and the advantages of those in the ship with the round stern were very manifest. And uh, we are specifically talking not just about the unicorn, but certainly the unicorn is included here. And the building there that you can see is the Navy Board's um, offices at Somerset House, well, it was then. Um, and Somerset House was where all of the instructions would emanate for the dockyards, informing them which ships were to be launched, when they were to be launched, how they were to be built, the designs would come out of here. And the Navy Board had 
total responsibility for the naval dockyards, although in, it, in turn it was responsible for the Admiralty, but the Navy Board had a huge amount of independence and that often frustrated the, the Admiralty. Um, another feature, as you're doubtless aware of the unicorn, is the fact that she has iron knees, uh, which you can see in this, this particular picture. Um, the, the reason for the, the iron knees is that timber ships built in the 18th century invariably had wooden knees. But there was becoming an increasing, it was becoming increasingly difficult to get wooden knees from, uh, from oak because um, the timbers used for wooden knees uh, were carefully shaped. So it, you couldn't just use any oak tree. It had to be an oak where the branches had been formed in a particular direction or shape. Often to do that, um, the, the best oaks were those in hedgerows and the Navy Board would identify suitable oaks or a timber surveyor from the Navy Board rather uh, would identify suitable oaks and they would often tie the branches down uh, to make sure it grew in the right position. And here we have a report of October 1860 referring to knees, but this actually refers to timber knees, but they are recognizing that certainly by the 18th, by 1860, there was a huge shortage of suitable timbers, um, but it states the general size of the tree, the height and thickness of the trunk below the branches and the length and diameter of the principal limbs, also whether these limbs are crooked so as to be useful for knees or straight. That's a, that's a description of what they're looking for in oak. But um, increasingly, Chatham, having now got two smitheries, was um, manufacturing not just um, a small amount of iron fittings for ships and anchors, but was now manufacturing large numbers of knees, iron knees that could be placed in ships, such as the Unicorn. The big move for Chatham, though, um, was the construction of Achilles. This was the first ironclad warship built in a naval, in a naval dockyard. Warrior, which is at Chatham, uh, sorry, which is at Portsmouth, sorry. Warrior at Portsmouth was the first ironclad. She was built in a commercial yard. Commercial yards had taken responsibility for building ironclad warships. Um, and there was a suggestion that, uh, well, we ought to get rid of the naval dockyards because they aren't capable of building iron ships. One of the people behind that move was Gladstone, Prime Minister. Uh, I rather suspect, though, that he was influenced by the fact that he had shares, quite a lot of shares in commercial naval dockyard, uh, commercial yards, and therefore would uh, have had a direct advantage if uh, naval dockyards ceased to exist because all of the work would go to the commercial yards. The Admiralty didn't like the idea of uh, closing the naval dockyards because they said, well, what would happen in the event of a war? Uh, we try and get warships out. The commercial yards are going to turn around and say, well, all of their facilities are clogged up with uh, commercial shipping and the war is going to have to wait until they're ready. That wasn't quite the Admiralty's thinking. So um, in order to save the naval dockyards, it was decided to launch an ironclad at a naval dockyard. Chatham was chosen partly because of its experience in dealing with iron work, um, such as uh, the work it had done on Unicorn and later ships, but also small iron hold ships. Um, and in laying down the Achilles, it actually constructed it in a quicker time than the commercial yards and at a, and at a better price than the commercial yards, proving that naval dockyards could build um, iron ships. Um, as a result, chat, uh, this is actually the Achilles in, in, the, in, a dock, in, in a dry dock. She's under construction. Um, and next to that, on the right hand side of the picture, you can see number one covered slip, um, which has since burnt down. So it, it doesn't actually exist at Chatham any longer. That was burnt down during the 1960s. Always a bit of a mystery as to how it was burnt down. But the story is actually a, a young shipwright artist, um, apprentice who was smoking when he shouldn't have been. Um, and there we have the uh, first, the Achilles in the Medway. Um, she's been taken out to the moorings in the Medway. Presumably Unicorn herself would have spent some time in a similar position. Um, this is the dry dock in which Achilles was built. 
Um, and it is important to remember that Achilles was a turning point for Chatham Dockyard. Um, during the... Um, during the 18th century, Chatham had no longer become the most important of the naval dockyards. Portsmouth and Plymouth had well overtaken her. But in the 1860s, she once again became the most important of the naval dockyards because she was given the dockyard at Chatham received a massive extension. Um, and I'm not talking about this one here because this is just an extension to the dry dock, which was carried out by prisoners. I'm also noting the time, so I'm going a little bit faster at this point. Um, but she received a massive extension that um, quadrupled the size of the dockyard. So from 1860 to about 1880s, all this work was underway. Primarily, to begin with, this work was undertaken by convicts, uh, convicts sentenced to hard labour, uh, 1,200 of them, but the first task they were given was to build the prison. So Chatham received um, a prison built close to the site of the naval dockyard on St Mary's Island, that was where the extension, and that's the same extension I'm talking about, uh, where uh, the Dutch, or, or rather the ship that uh, had been burnt uh, during the time of the Dutch raid had uh, been taken into St Mary's Creek. So the first thing that happened was the convicts built their own prison that was completed um, in 1854 and sometime after they began work on this massive new extension. Here we've got a picture of convicts at work being overseen by uh, uh, one of the wardens. Um, some of those involved in the construction of the, the dockyard at Chatham were actually members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood um, because there had been a dynamiting campaign. And this is a picture of one of them. Uh, well, it's probably one of the only pictures that I have of somebody that was responsible for building the naval dockyard at that time, who I can actually name, Jeremiah O'Donovan. Uh, can't name him, but he's one of the wardens that uh, was responsible for overseeing the convicts. And one of the main tasks of the convicts was brick making because um, many, many millions of bricks were required for the expansion of the dockyard. And I suspect that, again, this isn't a convict. This is just um, uh, somebody, you know, uh, somebody, a driver, somebody who obviously a skilled worker here. Um, this was the original plan. Um, for the, the expansion of the dockyard, but this is where I really want to get to. This is the uh, Victorian extension of Chatham Dockyard as we see it today. Um, this map actually dates to 1943, but it, it shows the three huge basins that were built at Chatham Dockyard. They still exist, um, but they're in, the, they're in a part of the dockyard that is not the historic end of the yard. Uh, part of it is a shopping centre, but much of this area is also a housing estate, but the three basins do still exist. This is uh, the number two basin, the middle basin under construction in December 1871. You can see the massive amount of work that this is involved. Uh, it was probably, it was the largest civil engineering project of its time. Um, Portsmouth was to get a, a, a later extension, still during the Victorian period, as was uh, Plymouth, but the first of these extensions was carried out at Chatham, so Chatham was now the most important yard for a short period of time, and any new major iron warship, the first of its class, was always laid down at Chatham during this period, with uh, the other yards then constructing some of the class and commercial yards also, but the first was always laid down during the 1880s, 1890s, I think, up and, um, well, it was always Chatham because Chatham, as I said, was now the most important naval dockyard, but things were to change at, um, by the early 20th century because Portsmouth built Dreadnought and that really was something that, that meant that Portsmouth had effectively by that time fully overtaken Chatham once again and was now the most important of the dockyards. <clears throat> Uh, again, we can see construction work um, on one of the docks in the number one basin. The number one basin at this time was given four dry docks. And again, more work underway on one of the dry docks. And what you can see at the far end of that photograph is a caisson, a, uh, or what was always referred to as caissons in naval dockyards. This is a floating gate that would block the, um, that would be put in place once a ship had been brought into the dry dock. <clears throat> 
um, the last of the dry docks. Um, this is an interesting building. It's still there today at Chatham. Uh, it actually started life as a building slip, as a covered building slip in Woolwich. But when Woolwich Dockyard was closed in 1869, uh, those were sent, those from Chatham were said, well, go along to Woolwich, see if there's anything you'd like. And one of them obviously spotted this and said, yeah, we'll love that one. So it was brought down, it was brought down, uh, so it was brought down river from Woolwich and reassembled at uh, Chatham during the time of the extension. It's now a shopping centre or a covered shopping outlet. Um, dockyard pumping station from an early picture this also exists at Chatham today and the the number five dock that is actually the the first of the ones in the extension it's it's only known today as number five dock but I think it would be nice if they weren't reverted back to its original name because it's a bit more exciting the invincible dock and it's called the invincible dock because the first ship to enter that is, is the ship here HMS Invincible uh, a general view of the dockyard across the river. Um, right, some more early pictures of the dock. This is um, one of the early machine shops built. Uh, they were still ex they were still adding bits to the dockyard during the periods leading up to the First World War. Generating station. Um, I mentioned that the uh, resident commissioner was the most important officer in the yard. This is his house. You can see it's a substantial building. And um, when the Navy Board was abolished in 1832, the person who ch was charged with the yard was the Admiral Superintendent. Um, I said there was a magnificent collection of covered slips at Chatham, and this is the number three slip, which still exists, although it's seen here in 1947. Um, okay, World War II reenactment. Um, but anyway, the dockyard itself was closed in 1984, and this is two pictures, modern day pictures of the area of the Victorian extension. This is the number one basin. And you can just see there the opening into one of the dry docks and the taller building. I don't mean the two tower block type buildings, but the one that's sort of um, ghost like appearing from behind. That's the uh, shopping outlet, the, uh, the covered slip that arrived from Woolwich. And a large amount of the area of the, the dockyard. Um, this is St Mary's Island, which was all part of the naval dockyard. This has become a modern day housing estate. And we're now on to any questions.